Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Audio Advice Monthly Happy Hour live stream. We are welcoming back our good friends from SBS and a special guest today, Michael from Youth Man. So we'll be introducing everybody here real soon. Uh, thanks for joining us. Here's what you can expect in the next hour. Uh, we're going to introduce our all-star panel, and then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what it is that we're giving away today. Then we'll be talking all things, audio, taking your audio to new heights with Dolby Atmos. So if you have questions about Dolby Atmos, home theater, uh, go ahead and start putting those in the comments. We can see all these comments coming across YouTube, across Facebook, whether you're on our channel, Youth Man's channel, uh, SBS's channel, we can see all of those coming in. So start loading up your questions, and then we'll get into the topic of the day. So we'll, we'll uh, discuss that for a little while, and then we'll open up to some audience Q&A. And then we'll wrap it up with our awesome giveaway brought to you by SBS this month. So thanks again to our good friends from SBS. Let me kick it off by uh, introducing our panel today. Larry, welcome back. Thanks again for joining us. Let everybody I know uh, where you're where you're joining us from. And it is a happy hour, so cheers, gentlemen, and everyone. Yes. Let us know what you're drinking and where it is that you are joining us from. Uh, and then quick question to kind of throw you on the spot. Quick question, maybe not an easy answer. What is your favorite Dolby Atmos movie? Oh, man. So well, I'm, I'm coming to you guys from uh, the Dallas area. I'm in Arlington, Texas. And I don't really drink, so I have a cherry Coke from Sonic. There you go. Um, and my favorite Atmos movie. Well, I, let's just go with a recent one. I think the one that's kind of blown me away the most recently is going to be the Godzilla versus Kong. It's yeah. unreal. It's so over the top. I'd say, you know, I love playing Turtles for everybody, but that's a that's a real subwoofer demo. And it's just really to annoy people more than anything. <laughs> yeah, cool. That's a good, good one. Definitely a lot of uh, a lot of action scenes for sure. And uh, Nick, welcome back. Same question to you. Well, I have a uh, local Vermont beer here with my special koozie that uh, I'll be tuning in right there after nice. uh, this happy hour, keeping the happy times going. Um, and uh, let's see, my favorite uh, Atmos movie, I might actually have to give Larry some props on this one. In honor of Halloween, I'm going with Annabelle Creation. This is a horror mm. movie with some really, really thrilling Atmos effects that will get your uh, spine tingling. So uh, I feel like that's one of the best uses of Dolby Atmos is to create that intrigue and, and scare factor. So uh, Annabelle Creations is what I'm going with today. Absolutely. Uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, Leon, welcome back as well. Same questions to you. Yeah, I'm in Wake Forest, North Carolina, and uh, drinking a local Asheville beer, uh, Voodoo Ranger. And uh, I have to say my favorite Atmos demo, it's not really a movie, well, it kind of is a movie, is uh, Roger Waters' The Wall. It's a widescreen. It, the recording is amazing. And if you have good subwoofers, you will know that your pants legs are shaking. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to put it for sure. And um, another one, good one is Midway that has a very uh, yeah. similar outcome. Yeah, that's a great one. It's also on the, the Dolby Atmos demo tracks, right? Uh, actually, no, that's a different one. But anyways, uh, awesome. And then thanks for joining us for the first time. I want to introduce Michael from Youth Band. Thanks for joining us. Excited to have you. Appreciate the invite. Absolutely. Well, let us know uh, where you're joining us from, and then also if you've got a, a beverage here, what it is. And then again, same question, uh, your favorite Dolby Atmos movie that you've seen so far. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jonathan. Yeah, so I'm in sunny Florida. It's really nice here pretty much all the time, except for July and August, which is brutal. But right now we're starting to get some really great weather. Well, and so I'm drinking a little Celsius, a little zero calorie kind of thing, <laughs> just because I'd like to lose some weight, man. So, <laughs> that's, uh, right. so that's what I'm hitting today. And probably one of my favorite, just as far as Dolby Atmos, the movie's pretty good, but the Atmos in it is Gravity. Um, Gravity, the Lux edition, just has a phenomenal job of just placing those objects in kind of like real time. You know, so as they're flipping through space, you literally hear it go from top speaker to rear speaker to front speaker. and just gives you this real sense of immersiveness. So. Definitely really like that one as a demo when I'm trying to show people what Dolby Atmos is about. That's a great one. I love the love the variety. So awesome. Well, we are excited to be, like I said, to be talking all things Dolby Atmos. Uh, before we get started, just so everybody knows exactly what it is that we're giving away today. Nick, I'll hand it over to you to, to tell everyone what you guys generously provided for our giveaway this month. Sure. We have a, an awesome giveaway and, and sticking with the theme of Dolby Atmos, this is a full on 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos uh, surround sound speaker system that consists of, hey, look at that, a uh, two of our prime bookshelf speakers, one of our prime centers, two of the prime satellites for your surrounds, uh, what we consider the best 
Dolby Atmos speakers in the world, two of our prime elevations, and then our award-winning SP1000 Pro subwoofer handling those low frequencies. And of course, we'll give you all the cables you need to connect all that and turn any room into an immersive retreat for uh, Dolby Atmos home theater enjoyment. So uh, that's what we'll be giving away for the big prize. But uh, because we're feeling extra generous for the best question, we're also going to give away uh, the winner's choice of whatever SBS SoundPath audio accessory of their choosing. Uh, they get to choose between our ultra speaker cables, our SoundPath tri-band wireless audio adapter, which adds wireless connectivity to subwoofers or powered speakers, or our SBS SoundPath subwoofer isolation system which basically decouples your subwoofer for the floor to get rid of some of that room rattle, makes you a better neighbor, but you can also use it on turntables, loudspeakers, other components as well. Uh, so your choice of one of those three accessories uh, for the best question of the evening. Yeah, so keep uh, loading those questions. We'll get to as many as we can. And again, thank you for the, the gener generous giveaway this month. Awesome, uh, $2,300 value, which is just awesome for a full $5 nice. one to Dolby surround sound system. So again, I'm Jonathan drinking a red oak from just down the street here in Raleigh, you know, about an hour away near Burlington and uh, excited to be back with everyone. Thanks again for joining us. And it's great to see people joining us from all over the country and, and really all over the world. So yeah. uh, Leon, quick question to you. Obviously Leon, if you guys don't know, Leon founded Audio Advice back in 1978. So just a little over 40 years ago. Uh, we have two stores, one in Raleigh and the other in Charlotte, servicing the entire Southeast for high performance home audio, home theater, home automation, and of course, a great national e-commerce website, uh, which we love and engaging with so many folks. But Leon, tell everybody, if they want to come experience SBS in person, what it is they can see both in Raleigh and in Charlotte. Yeah, we've got two dedicated rooms set up, actually, and uh, <clears throat> it's just, you'll have a great experience. Uh, we've got in the showrooms in Raleigh, we've got three dedicated front projection home theaters. Charlotte has two. Um, our sales staff is just so passionate and enthusiastic about the gear that we sell. I think you'll just have, it's like going into a really great toy store. So if you're in the Charlotte area or Raleigh area, please stop by one of our stores. You'll have a blast. Yeah, you can see the latest and greatest from SBS. And again, a full dedicated SBS system in either location. So if you're heading to the beach or you're heading to the mountains, please come stop by, check us out. And of course, we have a tremendous amount of SBS content online that we'll be linking to throughout the next hour. We'd love for you guys to check that out if you haven't. That's a picture right there of our Raleigh, one of our room, showrooms, or one of our rooms in Raleigh, uh, again, where you can see the SBS towers, full surround sound, subwoofers, you name it, we've got it on display. So again, great partner. We've loved and enjoyed working with you guys, and it's just uh, it's been a ton of fun. So Nick, with that said, I will get out of the way, hand it over to you to... Uh, discuss all things taking your audio to new heights with Dolby Atmos. First, I just have to compliment your interior decorator. Whoever uh, set up those, those <laughs> last couple rooms, um, they, they deserve uh, uh, extra props for uh, for making such a beautiful That's, setup. Uh, definitely Heather on our marketing. That would be Heather. That's Heather, right. Heather. <laughs> kudos to you, I must say. Um, well, obviously the theme of tonight is Dolby Atmos. It is immersive surround sound home theater, but uh, we did want to dedicate a little bit of time to talking about some of the other essentials that go into creating that sort of immersive home theater experience. And obviously the sound is what I consider to be the most important part, but there's something uh, also that's pretty important and that is the video aspect of things. And to, to talk a little bit about that, uh, I'm gonna kick it to you first, youth man. And, uh, and I wanted to see if you could give some tips for folks uh, when they're choosing a display, basically, for the size or maybe projector versus flat screen, what are some insights you can share that will get people on the right track towards choosing the best video display for their home theater setup? Sure. Appreciate the, the question. It's a great question. So I definitely, I'm kind of with you. I love the audio probably more so than the video, but I love when I created my home theater, I wanted to have, I wanted to recreate pretty much what you would experience in your local cinema. And originally I had taped off at that time, probably 14 years ago, 55 inch TV was the standard. And so I took some masking tape. I went to walmart.com, found the, the width and the height and I masked it off, you know, on my room. And I stepped back and I looked at it and I went, oh, wow, this ain't going to do it, you know, for me. And so that's when I made the route to or made the decision to go down the projector route. And so, you know, definitely you got to take into consideration, you know, is this in a living room environment? Is it in a dedicated space? If it's a dedicated space, pretty much you probably have light control. You can fully get that room really, really dark. And so a projector might be a better fit. 
but a lot of people can't do projection in the living room. Um, so they're going with bigger TVs, 75 inch, 85 inch TVs. Um, so honestly, there's just a lot of different things that you need to look at. Um, my room is, uh, I've got a 150 inch diagonal in 2.35 to one aspect ratio. So that's like the really wide, what you would experience at most movie theaters, you know, when they pull back the curtain after the, the credit or not the credits, but like the intro and the movie previews. And so I wanted, again, to replicate that same experience in my theater room. THX really would like you to have about a 36 uh, degree. So from where your primary listening or primary listening position and, and viewing position, you want about a 36 degree angle of where your eyes are. So that way you're not having to turn your head and turn your eyes and you can kind of capture all of that just by looking straight. Um, but in typical youth man fashion, I don't always follow the rules. Um, so my viewing angle is much wider than that. I'm actually nine feet from 150 inch. Um, so what I, yeah, it's a little insane. And, and that goes against pretty much everything that Dolby uh, or THX suggest. Um, so yeah, so there is pretty much, I wanted it to be wall to wall. So my room is 13 feet wide and the screen is about 12 feet wide. So it's a pretty close fit. If I were to, to be able to have a deeper room, I'd probably back my seats up maybe about a foot, but I still like that really, really immersive experience. And so one thing I would suggest to do, especially if you're going projection and you're trying to figure out what size, if you've already got your projector, at least shine it on the wall and just kind of, you know, try some different sizes and distance from that to kind of see what your eyes uh, prefer. But again, you kind of want to do that about 36 um, degrees as far as the, the width of that viewing angle. And, you know, you, typically you want to try to keep that screen, whether it's a TV or a projection, probably in the either the center or the lower third of that with your eyes so that you're not having to look way up in the air, or look down at the TV. So those are just some things that, that I've done in, in my own setup. Uh, but again, I don't have a whole lot of experience with OLEDs and LEDs and micro LEDs because we don't even have a TV in our living room. We just have the theater room. Um, and uh, I had an 82 inch in the living room and it just it didn't do it for me because I had a big, you know, screen in the theater room. And so, uh, so it's one of the, yeah, I'm glad so you brought up the like the mounting angle or, or where you should mm -hmm. place them, because Larry, looking at this, what, what immediately jumps out to you about this home theater setup? Well, I, I, anybody that's watched us uh, or been in conversation, I'm not a huge fan of TVs over the fireplace mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. You know, it's just not a comfortable view, um, you know, and you run into you can't always put everything in the best possible spot. Sure. Uh, so, you know, a couple of solutions you've got out there, some different mounts. The angling that they did here is great. Uh, there's also mounting systems that you can mount to the wall. Uh, Mantle mount makes one and. Uh, you can put it up on a wall and then actually pull yeah, it pulls down. down lower when yeah. you're watching it. So it's yeah. uh, there's a lot of different options out there. But um, I I the way my room set up downstairs, I have a dumb setup too in my living room because my TV sits in a corner on a piece of furniture, but it's a big 58 inch plasma. So I'm still a plasma guy. Nice. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know what plasma is. Can you explain? To us? <laughs> yeah, all the myths and rumors you heard are not true because my TV is I don't know, fourteen years old now, thirteen years old. So nice. it's it's still kicking. That's great that it's lasted that long. That's pretty yeah. cool. So I think the one of the important things to remember is you know I, I think you sort of alluded to it, Michael, but having like a paper cutout is a great way mm -hmm. to sort of see what takes up your field of vision, what's yeah. going to fit nicely on the wall. If you can avoid mounting it at an angle that's going to make you have to crane your neck up yeah. to be staring and, and potentially get that that neck pain from viewing angles, uh, always try to avoid that when possible. Um, and then I think the projector versus flat screen, it's really more of a matter of personal taste and what you can fit in your room. If you don't have a place for projector, yeah. you're more than likely going to go for a flat screen. I still think if you want the movie theater experience, so it is a projector because mm -hmm. that's what movie theaters use. I agree. It's just it, uh, big. We we yeah. have a lot of data on what customers like, and so we put that into our home theater tool. And uh, you know, in the average position, that's where our average customer felt was best. And we go more immersive and less immersive. So you can play around with that too. But Michael's pretty much right. You know, that's kind of the angles you'll go to maybe with a wider screen. You'll be 42. It's where we kind of found the average was. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and but, it's uh, worth noting, you know, there's short throw projectors, there's big massive ones that come out on the ceiling. Audio Advice will have a lot of different options for you based on, you know, what sort of setup your room has and uh, it can really basically modify it to uh, to get the best uh, visual representation possible. But we yeah. should point out, we did the math on Michael's while we were waiting here and he's at a 65. Don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing shade. Yeah, yeah right. man. Like well, I said, I'm audio. I feel like we could go <laughs> deep into the video and that might be for a, another happy hour there, John. I, could be. I think yeah. we should move on now. And the next sort of main component you need as part of your home theater is some sort of source component or AV receiver. And uh, for this, I'd like to first kick it to Larry to talk a little bit about the essential uh, options and features you need on a home theater receiver in order to kind of create this immersive experience. So, Larry, what are your uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's the guts of your system. It's the brains. It's where everything's going to go. Uh, if, if you haven't done home theater in a while or if you're in getting into it as kind of like your first steps, everything you want to watch, listen to, view is going to run through your receiver. So if you've got gaming systems, streaming boxes, satellite cable, any of that stuff that's out there, it's going to run through your receiver. So as you can see here, the back of this panel uh, on this receiver if you've got, so like down in my living room, we've got multiple gaming systems, our satellite box, 4K Blu-ray player, the streaming devices, the television, all of that runs through the receiver. And then we have a single cable that goes out of the receiver to the television for video. And I can't even tell you if the TV speakers work on that television because I haven't turned them on in more than 10 years. But you run everything through there and the receiver will do the switching. So I would say something that you'd really want to look for is making sure you find a receiver that has all the connectivity you think you're going to run into. So the more HDMI, the better in most cases, making sure that it's up to date. So most of the receivers you pick up today will be 8K compatible, so future ready, 4K capable, so ready for everything you're going to throw at it now. Uh, the best HDMI that you can get. And making sure that you've got enough channels, so enough output to go to as many speakers as you're planning on going to. And most receivers now today will handle a minimum of five, but up to you know, 13. So you can run quite a few off of a uh, receiver. So I'd look connectivity, power, um, ease of use is a really good one too. So check out the remote. A lot of people don't think about that if you're not going to do a, a secondary remote option, but it is going to be the guts and the brains of everything you run on there. So Leon, I know you have people coming into your stores all the time. They probably see something like this. They find it to be maybe intimidating. Like, how do I know what to do with all of these different inputs and outputs and settings? Um, what sort of tips do you have that can help maybe demystify or, or simplify the, the decision-making process when, when choosing an AV receiver uh, for your home theater? Well, yeah, to, to add to what Larry said first, I'd also think about the future because if you're like most of us, you're going to buy this and you're going to really get into it because a great home theater experience is just a barrel of fun. And if you think you only want five speakers now, you're probably going to want seven or more later. So get a receiver that has the options to maybe upgrade later. It may have preamp outs or more channels that you need. Uh, but it's you know, in, in for our, our local customers, we hook up everything and set it up for them. So it's um, it, it is just getting the right number of HDMI inputs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not too hard to hook it up yourself. But my, my you really want to plan for what you might need three to four years down the road. So you're not obsolete. It's always a good idea to look at receivers that preamp outs on them so you can later add more channels if you want to. Um, and that would be my my tip. And then good honest power you can always tell a lot by just the weight of the receiver if it's got a big massive power supply in it or not so um you know the, the I'm, I'm kind of on a soapbox now but it seems like we we're getting away from the standards of you know rating receivers at 20 20 to 20k at low distortion at full power we're seeing these power ratings that are like at one kilohertz with one channel driven on some receivers right. And it's reminded me of the 70s when we had if struck by lightning was the power rating. <laughs> so, um, Michael, I know you've reviewed a lot of different AV processors, receivers, yeah. amplifiers on uh, the Youth Man YouTube channel. And I'm curious what insights you can add, uh, you know, both in terms of the differences between the various brands and models, but also, uh, again, just choosing the best one based on your, your future needs and your current needs. Sure. I know one thing that's big on for me personally is, is the room correction software that's built into it. 
Um, and sometimes that comes down to preference. Some people love the Wipow that Yamaha presents. Um, I personally like Odyssey, um, but then there's also things like Dirac. So um, really just having a good room correction, I think is really key because most of us don't have an ideal room and we've got some issues in the room. And so the receiver is trying to make some adjustments with EQ and time delay and all that stuff internally so that it can kind of give your speakers the best performance that they can, that they can, because the room acoustics is huge in a room. Um, and the other one, Leon mentioned it is having the ability of pre outs. I can't tell you how many times people say, you know, man, I, I, I had five speakers and now I've added seven or I've added nine and it used to sound really good, but for now, you know, for some reason, my, it just doesn't sound as dynamic as it used to. Well, unfortunately the receiver's just running out of gas you know, that one single power supply is now having to divvy up that power to more speakers. And if you don't have efficient speakers, then it's going to really tax that. And so having pre-outs is a great way that you can kind of take some of the load off of that amp, even if you're only taking off maybe three channels or five channels and then letting the, the AVR or the receiver handle the Atmos speakers or maybe your surround speakers. Totally agree, Michael. That is so true. One, one quick plug, if you're, if you're purchasing a home theater from Audio Vice, whether it's in-store, one of our two stores, or nationally, uh, we have the ability to help you with your room correction, whether it's Dirac, whether it's uh, Arc, you know, you name it, we can help you with that from, from start to finish. So something we're obviously very well versed in. I'm glad you brought it up, Michael, and it's you know, something that we're more than happy to help folks out with. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on with the AV receivers uh, that may mm -hmm. seem like it's it's overwhelming to understand all the different functionality they have. But when you have, you know, folks like Audio Vice that are walking you through it, uh, there's really not that much that it has to do. So it's about getting it set up correctly, one and done, and then it's really going to serve you well for uh, for the long term there. Um, and right. I think that brings us to the, uh, the meat of our conversation today, which is Damn. taking audio to new heights with Dolby Atmos surround sound. Um, and we are going to walk through the various elements of the home theater. Uh, but I thought maybe, Michael, you could uh, kick us off by giving us a, a brief explanation of just what Dolby Atmos is. And we should also mention DTSX and RO3D, which are also yeah. immersive audio formats. But so I don't have to say that every single time I refer to it. We're just going to talk about Dolby Atmos. Immersive, uh, but give yeah. us a little bit of a insight on what you know about Dolby Atmos, where it came from and what it does. So the good thing is I absolutely, I'm like you guys, man. I, I love a good movie. And to me, where I've seen the most, one of the most changes in the home theater experience is now being able to have what they call immersive audio. And so basically, you know, back in the day, I'm, it's sad that I can actually say that now, but back in the day when I first started in the home theater, <laughs> We had, you know, just a bed layer. So we had like five speakers, three up front, and then maybe two in the back. And that did a pretty good job of surrounding you with sound. But now with things like uh, Dolby Atmos, DTSX, Oro 3D, we've now added height uh, speakers or maybe in ceiling speakers. And with Dolby Atmos, what's really nice is they use what they call object-based um, audio. And what it allows the sound engineer when they're mixing a movie, they can literally kind of almost like in a way, just think of somebody with a joystick. They can take and say, OK, I want this sound to be placed right here or maybe I want it to move from here to over here. And so it can seamlessly pan from, say, your left rear surround to the front speaker or to the height. And to me, where that really comes into play is um, oh, I'm trying to remember what is the movie Oh my goodness. Now I'm, I'm forgetting, but it's got these crazy creatures and it, Oh, it's uh, a quiet place. Quiet place. Have you guys quiet. seen that? Yes. Crazy, crazy movie. That's another great one for Dolby Atmos. And there's one scene where this creature begins to walk above her. She's kind of like down in the basement and you hear him like move from the front top left speaker and then pan over to the top right speaker and like the whole time you're going, dude, please don't come down here, you know, because and that's what it's designed to do is immerse you into the movie. Um, you know, a lot of people or some people complain that I want to hear more out of those channels. And to me, you're not always going to have content above you or in your side surrounds or in your rear surrounds. It should never be to the point to where it, it pulls you out of the movie when you hear that sound 
the goal is to keep you in the movie and make you feel like you're a part of that movie, you know? So in things like um, Ford versus Ferrari, when the, when the plane flies overhead, you know, you'll hear it come from like your front speakers and then it'll pan up to the, you know, in my case, I've got four Dolby Atmos in ceiling speakers. So it'll go to the front two speakers, then to the rear two speakers and then down to my rear surrounds. And so really that's just a, a, just an incredible way of being able to really just bring yourself and make you make yourself immersed into that movie experience and just add that really, really cool element. So I love Dolby Atmos. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I've heard some great Oro 3D setups. It's a little bit different as far as the angles that they recommend for that. I think Oro 3D wants like 30 degrees from your viewing angle um, or listening angle, I guess it would be. And then Dolby Atmos, I think, is about 45 degrees. Um, so, but to me, that's it's just a fun experience. And so, if you have uh, the space, if you've got the budget to add a couple more speakers, and if you've got the AVR, again, Leon yeah. mentioned, think about ahead of time. Maybe you only have five speakers now, but down the road, you may want to add some more and, and see what this whole Dolby Atmos thing is about. And so, having that capability down the road is going to going to be great and that way you don't have to upgrade your I think AVR. a lot of people sort of are get on the fence about all right i have a 5.1 should i go to that 7.1 or should i start mm -hmm. adding the height channels and and to me it's it's no debate if you have the opportunity to go to a 5.1.2 or 0.4 with that 0.4 being two or four speakers mm -hmm. above you you know to have the the ambient effect as well as the object-based surround sound where there's individual sounds coming from points in space it just mm -hmm. adds sort of yeah. a dumb level of immersive audio that you can't get from that single plane of surround sound. And we're going to talk a little bit more about placement and some of the different options uh, for Dolby Atmos speakers. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to quickly walk through the different channels of surround sound to talk about their purpose and their importance, uh, just for educational value, but also to, to put it in the perspective of why Dolby Atmos matters. And Leon, I'm going to kick the first one to you because I feel like you've probably listened to some two channel in your life. So maybe you could briefly explain what the uh, purpose of the front left right speakers are in a, uh, in a 5.1 or beyond type home theater setup. Yeah, well, many times the music soundtrack will come out of those exclusively. And uh, you you got to nail those. And if you're playing concert videos in your home theater, uh, they're going to be very important. But uh, I think, you know, ideally, in an ideal world, you have the same speakers for your left, right, and center. So when things pan across the front, and Michael's got that, I have that in my theater, it's a total seamless pan when the pan is just across the front channels. Um, and then, of course, I totally agree with you, Nick. Don't do seven over putting the Atmos in. If you've got yeah. the lower bed channels, go with the Atmos speakers because you now are in that dome of sound. It's just so important to do. And so, you know, you have your front left. Those are sort of anchoring the front stage on the left and right side. But often what's considered the uh, most underrated speaker in a home theater setup is that center channel. And Larry, maybe you can talk a little bit about why the center channel is so valuable uh, in a home theater setup. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right out, the center channel is the most important speaker in your system. And the reason for it, it's doing all the work of everything you want to listen to in regards to dialogue and most of the stuff that's happening directly on the screen. So whether you're watching the news, a concert, uh, an over-the-top theatrical experience, you're going to get 90% of the dialogue coming from the center channel. And so there's a couple different types of center channels. There's what's considered a two-way center channel or a three-way center channel. And what you'll see on a two-way center channel will typically be like two mid-range drivers and a tweeter, with the tweeter being right in the middle. And in a three-way center channel, we'll do uh, two woofers, a mid-range, and then typically a tweeter on top. And if you can add more range to your center channel, so right there is the ultra center. It's a three-way center channel. And what you'll see is by having a three-way center channel, you get more of the dialogue, the frequencies, the capabilities, and a much wider viewing angle, too. So by having those multiple drivers there, that speaker can handle like Darth Vader, Barry White, Mariah Carey, Yoda, whatever you're listening to, the local news, all directly. And by offering the multiple drivers in there, it's also creating a wider soundstage. So not everyone sits directly in front of their screen. So if you get a large family and you're all on a sectional couch or in multiple seating areas, you will have a better experience all the way around for anyone 
if you can go with the three-way center channel. And there's not a lot of brands that offer them, which is kind of crazy. We do it on both, our, uh, both of our series. Our Prime series and our Ultra are both three-way center channels. And Leon, I know you mentioned it's great to be able to match your left, right, center, um, you know, and having them be all towers or all the same speaker. But there's a method to the madness of the design of a center channel and, and having it in that horizontal array. And it may seem obvious, but really it's about placement. And oftentimes the center channel is going right below or right above a screen, uh, preferably below. And so by having it be a little bit narrower and horizontal, uh, you're able to place it more easily like you see in this setup here without having to raise the screen so high. And oh, totally the agree. The only time you can, the, the best time to do it is when you've got a situation where you've got a front projection screen that's acoustically transparent and they're all right behind it, right centered up. For normal, most applications, this is the best. And in the case of you guys, here, while they don't aren't the same, they do have matching tweeters. The base drivers are very similar. So you're still going to have that nice seamless blend. The, you know, very important. The center is the most important speaker. And it, it needs to match to your main speakers again. So when that pan goes across it, there's no transitional differences in the sound. So you guys do a great job of matching up your centers to your main speakers as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's a great point. And one of the, the key placement tips that you can uh, you know, take into advisement when you're setting up your front stage is try to get those tweeters aligned as evenly as possible on a that's right. pan. And then uh, as close as you can get them to ear level as well. So if you can get those tweeters at ear level and all aligned together on the front stage, you're going to get the most cohesive sound stage and the, and the best representation of uh, whatever movie or music that you're listening to. Hey, Nick, real quick. I know we'll get to some audience Q&A, but uh, Victor Valenzuela right, asked a question. He just said, uh, can you tell me the difference between the prime center channel and the ultra center channel while we're on that topic? Larry, you want to dive into that one? Yeah. So if you look at our Prime Series versus our Ultra, it really comes down to uh, what the Ultra Series is significantly larger. It's a larger uh, product all the way around. Between all of our Ultra Series and our Prime Series, Ultra is larger. Also, the driver makeup is a little different. So the Prime Series is it's a conventional polypropylene, you know, normal speaker cone like everybody's used to. But whenever you're moving into the Ultra Series, it's a, it's a performance driver. It's got a a higher end uh, blended cone where it's made up of multiple fibers and poly. So it's it's a more rigid uh, driver. So it can handle more frequencies, more volume. It's got a, a different crossover inside it. And the Ultra Series can handle more power. Um, so if you wanted to drive it, maybe say um, with a little bit more energy, you could do that out of the Ultra Series. But one thing that's really cool with our Prime and Ultra Series is they're timbre matched. So you can mix and match uh, our Ultra Series with our Prime Series, which I, I do personally in a couple different rooms, and we have a lot of uh, people that we work with do that too, because maybe you can't fit our Ultra Series, uh, maybe front stage, the towers, and so you might go with maybe a Prime Pinnacle Tower, and then you'll use our Ultra Center so you get the best experience from the Center Channel. You can totally do that. So one other thing I'll say about the Prime and Ultra Center, I mean, in simplest terms, the Ultra is going to get you a little bit more dynamic range, a little more dynamic output. So, uh, you know, crisper dynamics and just a little bit more volume and deeper low frequency extension. Um, and in general, those are the sort of main uh, differences in sound quality you'll get out of them. But like you said, they're, they're timbre match, so it's a very similar sound profile. It can just play a little bit lower and a little bit louder uh, in the simplest terms. Uh, so we have one more channel of speakers to discuss before we get into the Atmos. And Michael, what are your uh, what's your thoughts on uh, rear and side surrounds? I think we can lump those together when talking about a home theater setup. Yeah, and so I designed my theater room, like I said, about 15 years ago, and I pretty much had the same side surrounds and rear surrounds. And so mine are what they call like bipolar or dipole speakers. So they're they kind of shoot sound at two different angles, and that. At the time, that was good to kind of surround you and just dis disperse the sound. But a lot of people now with Dolby Atmos and DTSX, as well as Oro 3D, they're even moving to like a direct radiating, like a, a bookshelf speaker. But really, it's just up to you kind of what type of sound you're you're wanting there. Ideally, you want them um, now Dolby Atmos is recommending those be pretty close to your ear level, maybe a little bit above ear level. Again, back when I design my room they were wanting it about two to three feet above your ear level but we didn't have atmos speakers back then so now the thought is you want those kind of on a bed layer kind of low so that when you add atmos speakers there's a separation there and it creates this kind of bubble um so but with that you know definitely 
to me, my, my experience with setting up a home theater, sometimes you can get away. Like if your budget doesn't allow for, you know, really nice high end sides and rears, you can get away with maybe a lower profile or a smaller one because our ears are faced forward. And so it's not as critical for side surrounds and back surrounds, but I totally agree earlier. I would rather have a, a five channel bed layer with four, two, preferably four Atmos speakers than adding the surround back. Um, in my setup, I don't hear them near as much as I do Atmos. And so I think you'll get a much better experience um, by adding those Atmos. But but the side surrounds, again, they're just basically there so that when something pans around your room or maybe in the, in the movie that you're watching, you kind of see somebody walk from the rear left, uh, like behind you rear left, and then they walk to the front, you'll hear it move from the far back to maybe your side surround and then to your front speaker. And so that... Again, they're you just often, want to have that cohesiveness there. Yeah, they're they're often the hardest speakers to place too. I mean, you see on the picture here, they're mounted on the wall, but some people use them on stands. But typically, they're on the side of the room, the back of the room. Unlike mm -hmm. your front stage, where you know all your AV equipment typically is, um, you know, it's harder to find a place for your surrounds. And even yeah. with that, most speakers being able to go on your ceiling or high in a sidewall. Um, so I think your comment about if you do have to make a compromise. Um, it's not the worst thing to get surrounds that maybe are a little bit smaller. You don't need towers and, and whatnot yeah. back there. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly with uh, the ability to mount them on the wall or put them on stands, it does give you a little bit more versatility uh, when setting up a home theater. Uh, so now I think we're going to get to the actual uh, speakers that you can use and what the options are for Dolby Atmos. And, uh, and Larry, I guess I'll kick this one to you first. Uh, and you're going to be very, very uh, fair here. I... All options because you're trying to do it. It's just educate people about what's available, yeah. not new favorites here. Uh, but why don't you run through quickly what uh, what the options are for running Dolby Atmos in terms of your speakers? Yeah, so they, I, he's saying that because I'm a little biased towards a particular type. Um, there are th really three ways to kind of go about and do Dolby Atmos. So Atmos is the height effects we're talking about, the things that occur above you. And whenever it was introduced, the first way to do it uh, was using either an in-ceiling speaker which a lot of people have if you've got a, a space that's uh, been designed for speakers to be in your ceiling. Uh, but then there's also what's referred to as a topper. And a topper is a speaker that would sit on top of your front speakers or your rear speakers. And they're typically not very big. You know, they're about the size of the base of a speaker and would sit on top and they are directed to shoot sound up at the ceiling at an angle so that it kind of goes into the middle of your room. And they are designed to be um, a frequency limited speaker. So what that means is all it's doing is kind of putting background effects and kind of the smaller sounds up above you, not like a full range speaker. So you've got an in ceiling option, which you can put kind of in front of you, behind you, off to the sides, whatever your room allows. Then you've got the toppers, which that was probably the easiest way to do it because you just run wire from your receiver and just set it right on top of your existing speaker. So that was a really easy option for a lot of people. And then uh, my personal preference is going to Wait, be Larry, something on the wall. Before you get to this one, oh. I do want to put Leon on the spot here if I can. There's also soundbar solutions, too, that have, like, virtual Dolby Atmos. Am I right? Can you talk anything about those? <laughs> no, don't shake your head. You're, you're selling these now. <laughs> well, you know, it, they are better than the TV speakers, and some of the soundbars are good. But, you know, the, they have drivers this big. You know, they're – they uh, so, some do provide a decent Atmos effect, but there's really nothing like the separate speaker components. Um, um, are they using the bounce attack, uh, effect? Are they? They're, they're, they're all using them? the bounce effect. They all have drivers kind of on the top that use the bounce effect. Okay. And uh, the ones that have some kind of room EQ that listen to what's going on do better, I think, than the ones that don't. Uh, but there's no comparison to you know even a you know two Atmos speakers in a 5.1 bed system is just no comparison. Right. All right. Larry, I didn't want him to say that after we talked about ours and have a, like a big sort of want, gotcha. want moment. So uh, now now you may proceed. And I'm going to put a visual yes, on so screen the, here which shows the extreme version. Or, uh, yeah. Uh, so in, in my opinion, and I think pretty much everybody the, that's really into the hobby, the best way to go about getting Atmos is doing what's considered a direct radiating speaker. And so I want you to all think about your cinematic experience when you walk into a movie theater. Where are the speakers? They are on the walls and they are on the ceiling. They are not in the wall. They are not in the ceiling. They are surface mounted speakers that are aimed where? 
at you so that you get the best possible experience. And now the speakers you're seeing here on the walls and the ceiling, that is our prime elevation. And that is what SVS does as our introduction into height effect speakers. So it's a speaker that it goes on the wall or on the ceiling. It can even go on its side to be used as rear or side surrounds and aim into your listening position. And the difference between this and say most in-ceiling speakers or a topper is it can handle a lot more frequency capabilities. So you're not getting just background noises like rain and whooshing of jets and stuff like that. You're going to feel King Kong chasing you down and Ready Player One and get the breathing and the growling and the explosions all occurring up above you. And a real perk of it being direct radiating is you're going to have a blend between your front stage and your back. And I think that's the one that is kind of the most eye-opening for people, whether we're We've done our in-store events or uh, any of us that have a system that bring a friend over, you're kind of looking around like, man, where'd that come from? That was cool because it is enveloped. And uh, in my room here, this is my game room slash office slash kids playroom. We've got a, a 5.1.2 in here. We've got towers, uh, center channel. I've got some satellites up here behind me and then on either wall, kind of uh, up here next to all my albums and stuff, I have a pair of the elevation speakers too. And it's cool because you can watch a movie and have it go directly from front to the middle of your room to behind you. And I remember one of my favorite demos to do back in the day was the movie Dragonheart with Dennis Quaid and Sean Connery. Because yeah. there's a scene where Draco the dragon flies around uh, the Dennis Quaid character and you hear the wing flap out of one and the voice happen out of another speaker. But there's always this gap because there's only five channels. And now with receivers able to recreate that, it's everywhere, and it's really, really cool. And Jonathan, I have to, to, jump, to jump in. Another great thing about the elevations is, you you know, it's if you're in an existing construction, it's really hard to get wires into your ceiling. Mm -hmm. But with these, you can just, it's not that hard to snake wires up a side wall and mount these up high, and they, they provide a great Atmos effect without having to go over and cut holes in your sheetrock to get into the ceiling. And they include the mounting hardware. I'm trying to grab it off my desk here. So it's just a two-piece mount. Uh, so it's super simple. So in the box with the speaker, you get this piece that goes on your wall. And then this piece that goes in the back of the speaker. And you literally just pop it in there once it's on the wall. So if you're, if you're handy with a drill, it's less than 10 minutes per speaker. And because it's a full range speaker and the way it can be mounted and directed... They don't, they don't have to be perfectly placed. So, you know, room placement isn't as big a deal as it used to be. So if you've got a beam or I say questions uh, coming through about uh, uh, raised ceilings and arches and stuff like that, it, that speaker is perfect for it. And then your receiver, and I know we're going to talk about this in a little bit, will recognize that and compensate for it. So, Leon, you answered my question before I asked it. I was, I was going to uh, basically uh, to say, what are, how do you determine which one of these solutions is right for you? And I think if you're in a new build construction and you want zero visibility as far as your speakers go, you're in a great situation for in ceilings or, uh, or on Yes, wall. exactly. Yep. And then if you yeah, don't it, mind, it really dep it's, it depends upon the construction and if you can get into the walls and get wires around, but... You guys, prime elevation is just such a good option compared to using toppers. Because you know, most, you know, you, uh, any electrician can usually come in at the base level and get a wire up that side wall. It's a lot harder to get over that header and get into the ceiling to do in wall speakers later. So yeah. it's a great solution. And I think one of the other benefits that it affords is, you know, placement. There's a lot of questions about placement of Atmos speakers. And, you know, very few people have a perfectly square or a perfectly rectangle room where you're able to use any spot on the wall in order to put your speakers. And so this allows you, again, to, to use the ceiling, to use high on the sidewall. Typically, you want that aligned with the main listening area if you're going to have only two of the Atmos speakers maybe a little bit in front, a little bit behind. If you're gonna be running four Atmos speakers, high on the sidewall where it's a little bit in front of the seating area and a little bit behind again, so you can get that panning effect from uh, front to rear. Uh, that's typically the best placement areas for Atmos speakers. But I know there's resources on the audio advice site as well as with uh, your team and then also Dolby. Uh, if you Google search for it, you'll be able to find uh, their exact scientific recommendations for where you should put these speakers for the best possible performance uh, for your Dolby Atmos setup. Um, I do see in the comments, a lot of folks are asking, well, if I, what if I don't own a home, if I'm renting, if I'm leasing, 
uh, in an apartment or something like that. Obviously, that makes things a little bit more complex where maybe you do look at a subwoofer option. Uh, but I know a lot of folks certainly in that situation, especially, you know, in this environment, of being at home more and more. Well, the yeah, other or, thing with the, I was gonna say, with the elevations, in most apartments, you're allowed to mount stuff to a wall so long as you're not like cutting stuff into it. So the elevation is just simply four screws that go into a wall. And I think you all know the old trick of, uh, you know, plastering it up before you move out or people I've heard doing toothpaste and paint or whatever. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do it. But in, this is a bedroom and I change things in here a lot. And so I just ran wire up behind a curtain here and you don't even see it or I used something yeah. else to kind of hide it. And you can buy wire channels that you just stick to a wall and paint. So there, there's a That's lot right. of options out there. Like the little yeah, you, you don't have to hide the wire in the wall. You can put a channel up there if it's uh, something that you can't damage the walls and you just pull it off and a little paint and you're done. Yeah, Brian so likes your toothpaste uh, illustration there. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Landlord approved. Maybe That's right. Um, but yeah, so obviously once you've got them all set up and placed, uh, especially if you're going from a 5.1 and you're adding Atmos speakers, you're always going to want to rerun your room calibration. Mm -hmm. uh, so Michael, I want to kick this one to you because I'm sure you've done this more than a couple times oh, my goodness. running calibration. But uh, what can you share about uh, both doing it from the beginning or after you've already added uh, a set of Atmos speakers? Sure. And like Nick said, anytime that you add a new component, it really is a good idea to go ahead and rerun that calibration because things have changed. If you bought new speakers, they may have different capabilities. And so your receiver needs to try to compensate for that. Um, same thing with your subwoofer. If you move them around in your room, they're going to interact with your room differently. Um, to me, I always recommend um, a lot of times with like Denon and Marantz, they'll come with it. I call it the, uh, the rocket ship. It's like literally a cardboard uh, tripod. It doesn't yeah. work that good. Um, just get a cheap tripod. I mean, we're talking like 10 bucks, 15 bucks on Amazon. Put it in your primary listening position so that that microphone stays straight. And, and that's going to be, yeah, there you go, right there. Just get something real inexpensive. Right yeah. With Dirac, it actually typically comes with that microphone stand. So that's really nice if you've got an AVR with that. Um, but definitely get that first one, you know, locked in, get it right at about ear level where you would primary, that's like your primary listening position. For me, it's my center front row. And so that's going to be the first measurement you take. And then your auto, your auto calibration is going to walk you through placing the microphone in the next spot. One thing I would definitely, I always try to tell people this because I didn't realize it for a long time. I thought since I had six theater seats, I was supposed to put the microphone in each seat. The problem is, is there's, I don't think there's any room correction software out there that can accommodate, you know, great sound in every single seat. And so you really want to keep that within like, I think it's like two feet from that main uh, position. And so you're going to move it maybe six positions, eight positions, depending on your room correction software. Um, so, but definitely running that when you get new components, um, but again, some people even like it off. So I just always tell people, try it both ways. See what sounds better in your room. The other thing that I always, um, that I like is with, um, if you've got an AVR or processor that does um, Odyssey, um, you can download the app. It is 20 bucks, but it unlocks a lot more stuff for you. You can adjust curves and you can turn on um mid-range compensation and off and see what sounds better to you. So there's definitely some more features on that. And for me, I love the fact that, that, you know, Larry and Nick can send me their brand new speakers and I can run Odyssey. And when I'm done, I can load back up my preference, you know, my speakers that are in my room. And I don't have to recalibrate it for, you know, from my system. Um, so does that answer your question? I, yeah, that's, I think that's that. a great explanation. And, and the only other thing I, I would add, and actually, Larry, I'm going to kick this one to you. And we need to save time for subwoofers because I know Leon's yep. got some uh, good oh, yeah. thoughts about that. But when you run calibration, it doesn't necessarily mean the job is done. There are certain tweaks you can make after the fact, whether for personal 100%. preference or for certain 100%. room issues. Larry, can you give us a little insight on uh, some of your top tips there? Yeah. So first I'll tell you, turn down your subwoofer. Uh, because your receiver, no matter the brand, is going to recognize it, and it's going to turn it down internally mm -hmm. for you. So turn it down to about half volume, and then once you're done with your calibration, then turn it back up uh, at the sub. But 
one thing you'll always find, it's going to recognize things and it's never 100% accurate. So the first thing I always check after I run a room calibration, regardless of brand, is how it recognized my front stage. And you can be running bookshelves or towers or satellites, and there's a lot of receivers that will recognize them as a large speaker. And if you're running, I mean, if you're running really any tower on the market that you're not running separate amplifiers for, uh, you're probably going to want to go ahead and set those towers to a small setting. Uh, that way, the receiver is not working too hard to send a lot of information to that speaker that's unnecessary. And so your subwoofer can do the job that it's there for. So setting speakers to small, if their tower is typically a 60 or 80 hertz crossover, uh, adjusting your center channel level accordingly, and uh, just essentially making sure that all the distances are, for the most part, pretty accurate. Uh, outside of that, I think most of us probably like to do this, but I tend to bump up my rear channels just a little bit as a lot of people do, uh, for a little bit more energy when it's quiet. Uh, but it's really kind of getting it down, playing it by ear. But I, the number one call we get to our sound experts line, and I'm sure you guys do too at Audio Advice, is my subwoofer is not doing what I expected. And the second you flip that switch from large to small in your receiver, everything wakes up, the speakers and the sub. <coughs> That's right. That great insights and uh, a perfect segue into our uh, final session here uh, of the evening, which is going to be talking about bass and subwoofers. And, and Leon, I think you know a little something about bass uh, based on what you have in your home there. Can you share insights uh, on that and then also why bass is important in music and movies? Well, yeah, as someone who has five 18 inch subwoofers, yeah, it's it's important. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the foundation of music. You know, it's. Uh, and, but the, I think the most important thing to me is it takes the load off your main speakers. So they become much more dynamic. Your center channel just totally opens up. You, you, you know, a center channel with no subwoofer in a system could sound like this, you know, it, it can, can get honky. Um, Cause what's happening is you're taking the, the, the drivers have to really move to produce those low frequencies. And if you take that away, they just open up so much more and it helps your amplifier section because it's not having to reproduce those low frequencies. So huge benefits. And then multiple subs, you need them. They're great. One's great, but more than one is even better. So there are a lot of different types of subwoofers out there in the market right now. Here's uh, the largest and the smallest that SVS offers. Uh, so Larry, maybe you can provide a bit of insight on uh, the, I guess the two main types are sealed and ported, uh, but then also what you get for uh, you know a subwoofer of that size versus one of that size. Uh, just a brief overview of the different types yeah. of subwoofers available. So they, we, we do essentially two types. We do sealed box subwoofers, our FB models, and then ported models. And so that's our PB series. A sealed model, we like to say, is great at everything and poor at nothing because you can do music, movies, TV, gaming, daytime, nighttime, all of that. Sorry, my dog's trying to get in here for some reason. So you've got sealed models, uh, great for everything, easier to place. You can do multiples, as Leon was saying, put them in your rooms, have them take on a little bit more of the space. But if you do an, uh, a dedicated media room or you have a larger open concept space, then a sealed subwoofer may lack some of that oomph in there. And so that's where a ported sub comes into play. They will do more of that theatrical bass experience and a ported subwoofer will play louder at the exact same volume and will go lower in frequency output. So if you're looking at say uh, an SVS 2000 Pro, which is our most popular product, you'll have a sealed model and a ported model. If they're at the exact same volume from your receiver, the ported model is gonna be almost twice as loud and it will go three hertz lower on the base, meaning the real benefit there is not necessarily, oh, I can go super loud or that it's going deeper. It's that at lower volumes, a uh, ported subwoofer may be more present, uh, but a sealed sub subwoofer may have a little bit more detail. So it's it's kind of a trade-off as to what you're trying to accomplish in a room. But if you're doing a dedicated media room, most of us will probably recommend a ported subwoofer. And then the small one you're seeing there on the right, I, this picture really doesn't do this justice. I think six or eight of those micro subwoofers can fit inside the model on the left. So that's our PB16 Ultra, which is our flagship. And then our micro, which is a smaller than 11 inch cube. And the real perk of the micro subwoofer is it can go anywhere. I've got it under my desk right now, uh, partnered up with a pair of powered bookshelves, the Prime Wire. So it, it's really uh, beneficial because it can go anywhere and everywhere and be used for uh, anything, movies, music, 
theater, all that stuff too. So we could spend a, a whole uh, hour just talking about subject right. calibration and tuning, uh, but I do have to throw a, 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 some props to Youth Man who put together the most meticulous overview of the SVS subwoofer control app that is on YouTube. Uh, it allows you to do a lot of that fine tuning and, and DSP programming within your subwoofer. Um, so uh, Youth Man, why don't you give us a few little nuggets about what you know about subwoofer tuning uh, before we uh, wrap and get into some Q&A. Yeah, so I'm definitely not a subwoofer expert, but I, I'm with uh, Leon. Don't lie. I like no lie, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like bass, and I, I truly believe that, you know, having quality subwoofers can make or break your home theater experience. If you've got a subwoofer that that can't handle low frequencies, when that big you know gorilla lands on the on the freeway and and Kong or whatever or in Ready Player One. You know, your subwoofer is going to struggle with that. And so definitely subwoofers play a really crucial role in that overall experience. Um, to me, I know that I've always had Odyssey turn my subwoofer way down, just like Larry said. So don't be scared afterward to kind of bump that up. I tend to bump it up probably about 5 dB. Um, the other thing I try to tell people when you're calibrating your subwoofer um, don't just crank it up, you know, because what's going to happen is in the middle of your movie, your ears are going to be kind of drawn to where that subwoofer is and you want it to really be balanced with the rest of your system. You know, of course you want to feel that impact. You want to experience that pressure in your chest or your legs or whatever. Um, in, in Leon's case, it will rearrange your organs, um, you know, so, but it's one of those things where you try to get it balanced. And I've always kind of thought that, um, and, and I've shared this with people on my channel is that the only time you should notice your subwoofer is if you turn them off. And so to me, I just want it to be a very balanced system to where not one single speaker is kind of drawing attention to himself itself, but it's just, you're just immersed in that whole, you know, theater experience. And so having multiple subwoofers, a lot of times will help you get what they call better seat to seat performance. So it'll smoothen out, smoothen? That's not even a word. Smooth out the bass from one seat to another. But I always even recommend um, picking up like a, um, a U-Mic 1 from Mini DSP and measure to see what is going on in your room. Because a lot of times you're hearing bass, but when you look at the graph, you may have like some massive peaks in certain frequencies. And if you can see that, especially like with the SVS app, you can go in there and kind of pull down those peaks and smoothen out that base. And I believe you'll get a much better experience in that uh, that subwoofer experience there. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, dual subs, uh, most people say it's one of the most uh, impactful upgrades they make because of that even room response and, and just not having those uh, nulls and those cancellations where, you know, yep. all of a sudden you're walking or you're sitting in a seat and it's like, where'd the bass go? Uh, yep. So I think that's an important point. And then just in terms of subwoofers in general, uh, quickly, they really should do five things well. They should play as loud as you want them to. They should go as low as you want them to. They should blend seamlessly with your speakers, which I think, Leon, was something you really alluded to. It should almost be like it's a single box. You can't locate it in the room, yep. but it's providing base for every one of these speakers, Atmos, Atmos included. Uh, so it's like this seamless blend of just better low frequency extension and output uh, across the board. And then really the uh, the final thing is uh, crisp speed and transients. It should be able to stop and start on a dime. I think some of uh, the lesser subwoofers out there, they'll have sort of a bloated or boomy sound, which really emphasizes a single note. Um, it should be accurate across the frequencies that it's playing. So if your subwoofers can do all of those things well, it's going to be the right subwoofer for you. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. Again, we're SPS. We could just sit here and talk about subs for the next uh, two hours. But uh, out of respect for time, uh, Jonathan, I think I'm going to kick it to you for uh, for some Q&A or whatever you want to tackle next here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're up against the clock here, obviously uh, right up against six o'clock. So I want to just, first of all, you know, thank you. Thank you guys for, uh, you know, all of your amazing insight. Nick, thanks for run, running us through, you know, very comprehensively, you know, all things Dolby Atmos, you know, uh, component by component almost. So, you know, props to you for doing such a great job. Hopefully everyone found this uh, educational and, and informational. And again, I know a lot of folks have posted a lot of questions and we will do our best in the next 24 hours to go back and answer as many of those questions as we can. So if we didn't get to your question, we apologize, but we'll go back and answer all those questions. Uh, lots of great questions. And again, provide links to a lot of the different content. So again, hope everyone found this uh, informational uh, and we had a great time. So again, cheers to everyone Absolutely. for joining us. 
and uh, we had a great time. So really quick, before we announce our winner, I do want to uh, this sorry, excuse me, announce what it is that we're giving away next month. We're back to our normal time. So next month, real quickly, we're going to be giving away, welcoming some of our friends from MoFi, the MoFi Studio Deck turntable paired with a pair of the Klipsch uh, Fives powered speakers over $2,000 value. So the link is live. Go ahead and enter that to win today. But I know now is the moment that everyone has been waiting for the winner of our amazing SBS $2,300 value. If I can get a virtual drum roll, if you will, from everyone. Uh, our winner today is Aaron Condor from California. So, Aaron, you are the lucky winner. Congrats awesome. to you. Congratulations, nice job, man. man. You will absolutely love. Kill killer setup. Killer setup. Absolutely. And you're going to be able to jump right into uh, all things Dolby. So that's it for this month's live stream. Again, SBS, you guys always do an amazing job. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Michael, great having you. Lots of great comments. People really uh, enjoyed your insight, your input, uh, and how smooth of a YouTube host you are as they have started saying. <laughs> so props to you. So again, thanks everyone for joining. We appreciate it. And we will see everyone again next month. Cheers. Take care, guys. Bye,